So I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to invite the chair of um, ABA Rule of Law Initiatives Board of Directors, Steve Zach. say you can't make everybody happy all the time. I am. I can't speak. <laughs> so I'm going to be very brief as they say. <clears throat> These are my remarks. Rolly. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here, particularly with the ambassador. We are very much excited about you hearing from you today, and we are honored with your presence. Do I sound as bad as I think I do? No. Can you hear me at all? Yes. Well, this is what happens after you speak about the rule of law for three years in a row. You have no voice left at all. I would like first to thank all of you for joining us. I know the House is still in session, but we'll have some additional folks come along. We have a tight schedule. So we'll try and hold to it. I would like to uh, first introduce to you our board of directors who spend an enormous amount of time every day working on rule of law just to make this a better world. Would you please stand and be recognized? This is a particularly exciting day for us, an important day. 25 years. This is the 25th anniversary. And we're happy that you're here to share it with us. And we're also happy that the leaders of the bar are here. Our president, who just gave one of the truly memorable speeches that we've ever heard, William Hubbard. certainly are excited about our new president coming on board, Paul Lett, who's here with us today. And of course, Linda Klein, our former chair of the House and future president. We have many, many dignitaries here. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have time to mention them all. You know who you are. Take a bow. Uh, Betsy Anderson, of course, is our executive director, without whom we can do nothing. I am shortly going to turn this program over to her. What usually happens is when I speak, you can barely see her lips move. So today, she's going to do both jobs. We're also pleased that we have the incoming president of the IBA here with us, David Rifkin. David. We have to be back at 1.30, so it's time for us to get on with the program, and I'm going to ask Betsy to come and take over from here. Thank you for your understanding. I appreciate you being here. I've been wanting to speak for Steve. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Uh, I want to say a, a special thank you um, on behalf of ABA Rowley's Board of Directors um, to our Chicago Host Committee, and in particular to its chairs, Bill Hane of Schiff Harden, who has served us ably on the ABA Rowley Board, and Tony Barash, who a dozen years ago retired from corporate practice to start a second career as a Rowley volunteer in Uzbekistan and he never looked back. We were really happy to recruit him back to the effort to co-chair uh, co -chair this host committee uh, this uh, summer, and they've led an energetic uh, group that is listed in your program and has helped make this event a great success. We're grateful, too, to our generous sponsors and co-sponsoring ABA entities. These are our co-sponsoring entities, and uh, these are our 
sponsoring uh, organizations. We're especially grateful to our rule of law champion level sponsors, the Claude Moore Foundation, McGuire Woods, and Cypher Shaw. I would also like to thank the Commission on Women in the Profession, which joined in hosting our distinguished speaker at this meeting. Let me uh, begin our program then, welcoming our members of the House of Delegates um, to join us and find places here and uh, invite somebody who needs no introduction, President William Hubbard, to say a few remarks. This is a unique day. It's not just the 25th anniversary. I have never seen Steve Zack when he's had a microphone by his lips that it not be like jet fuel that animated him and caused any ills to dissipate. Uh, but apparently, Steve, you're really struggling with it today, so thank you for being here and, uh, and soldiering on. Uh, I want to thank Steve and congratulations to the ABA Rule of Law Initiative on this important uh, milestone anniversary. I want to take a minute to pay special tribute to Homer Moyer, to Sandy Dallenberg, who could not be here today, but is surely here in spirit, and to Mark Ellis. Would the two of you who are here please stand, along with Jim Silkenet. Jim, along with Jim. This triumvirate, uh, along with the key support uh, from Jim Silkenet and the section of international law, had the vision and energy 25 years ago to launch then Sealy, uh, today Rowley. Let me also recognize all of the other current and former chairs of the ABA's Rule of Law programs who are here today. We have some former chairs. Please stand and be recognized. Your leadership over the years has been invaluable. Taking the Sealy idea and building it to what it is today, a flagship project of the American Bar Association, working in over 50 countries to lay the foundation for the rule of law, a foundation so essential for the realization of human dignity and economic development. One of the privileges of being ABA president is the opportunity to participate in Rowley's work and to see firsthand the impact these programs have. For me, that has meant traveling to Beijing and learning about our work with Chinese lawyers and advocates to advance environmental rights, domestic violence legislation, and legal representation in capital cases. Visiting Saudi Arabia and Lebanon to hear from our justice sector colleagues about their priorities and how the ABA can help. And meeting with bar leaders in the Balkans, leaders whose countries were at war less than a decade ago, but now have come together under ABA auspices to sign a friendship agreement. We're so pleased to have so many foreign bar leaders with us this week to continue our discussions and fruitful, fruitful collaboration. In these travels, I've been struck by the connections between our ABA agenda at home and abroad. Time and time again, we see the issues are essentially the same that our colleagues around the world are struggling to ensure access to justice, just as we are here at home. And that in the justice, and, and that in the justice system is a, and that in the justice system is a common challenge. Together we have much to learn from one another in our shared struggle to advance the rule of law. We also see that threats to the rule of law abroad spill over our borders. That, that the lawlessness in El Salvador that Ambassador Aponte is confronting brings desperate, unaccompanied children to our doorsteps. That weak governance abroad provides fertile grounds to terrorists who threaten our way of life. The ABA rightfully engages these challenges as they are manifest here at home. But we also need to stand with justice sector colleagues around the world to address the root causes of these problems. That is the ABA Rowley cause. That is the ABA cause on a global scale. We all should be enormously proud of this work, the impact it has had over a quarter century, 
and the promise it holds for the future. I'm delighted to be with you today and together celebrate this program. Thank you. Thank you, William, for those inspiring words and for all that you have done for ABA Rowley and for the rule of law around the world. I should have said at the outset, I'm, I don't think that maybe I didn't need to, everyone should begin eating and we are going to talk over lunch um, throughout and our um, great staff will slip your main course in uh, as you're ready. My uh, role at this moment is to take you down memory lane. We celebrate 25 years of the ABA's uh, rule of law efforts around the world. On your tables, you will find some snapshots that are evocative of much of that work. And if you see a picture of yourself or someone you admire and you want to take it at the end of the luncheon, feel free to do so. I'm going to share some of these standout moments um, with you on the screen as well. As President Hubbard mentioned, ABA Rowley began over lunch. 25 years ago, Homer Moyer and Sandy Dallenbert had lunch. And there, tossed around an idea that some of our justice sector colleagues in Central and Eastern Europe, and eventually the former Soviet Union as well, might be interested in exchanging information with American lawyers as they worked to introduce market-based legal systems. They got Jim Silkenat in the section of international law on board, and then recruited Mark Ellis as the first staff director to the cause, and ABA Seeley was born. Soon, dozens of volunteer ABA members were headed to Eastern Europe, working with justice sector colleagues throughout the region to respond to their reform interests and needs. An example of that work is this uh, early workshop to establish a constitutional court for the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and this solemn investiture of that court, so critical to knitting that post-war country back together. I learned recently that among other things, we provided the robes for this ceremony and we got them, we got them from a choir uh, outfitter in Northeast DC. <laughs> we supported the launch of dozens of law student groups, bar associations, and judicial associations. Here you see the founders of the Armenian Judicial Council hashing out a charter for how they would work and become a force for the independence of the judiciary and professionalism in their country. And here, newly minted lawyers from jo or, or, or judges in Georgia following a Sealy training. We introduced a whole new generation to adversarial processes. And wherever we went, a hallmark of our programs was, was to be responsive to the needs of our partners. And that continues to be a core principle of our work to this day. Whatever they needed, we tried to respond. That even meant painting a courthouse. And here you see then parliamentarian Mikhail Saakashvili on the left, later to become the president of Georgia, painting a courthouse with a judge and our Sealy volunteer on the, on the right. When this work began, it was expected to be relatively brief. Maybe last a couple of years, we'd help rewrite some laws, set up some new institutions, and, and be done with the project. We should have known better. As we know here in the United States, advancing the rule of law is a long-term project. And so Sealy grew. By the early 2000s, our annual gatherings of Sealy alumni numbered to the hundreds. And it was clear that there was a great need for similar work in other regions of the world. So the ABA responded, and other regional councils were born, supporting reformist lawyers in China, pursuing accountability in the Democratic Republic of Congo, advancing the rights of women lawyers in the Middle East, and supporting the strengthening of criminal justice in Latin America. In 2007, these five projects were knitted together in what is today the Rule of Law Initiative. Throughout, what has been critical to our success, what distinguishes the ABA 
from other actors in the rule of law development field has been people. All of you, members of the ABA, and leaders in our profession. Those volunteers have put their practices on hold, forged lifelong bonds with colleagues throughout the world. The power of these relationships is the power of change. We have been particularly fortunate to have the support of senior leaders in our profession. And here you see a stalwart CLE volunteer, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, in 1994 in Sofia, Bulgaria, discussing rule of law reform in that country. And Judge Abner Mikva, oops, there he is, <laughs> uh, with Jerry Shestak here at an ABA CLE meeting in Ukraine in 2002. And you had a sneak preview of Judge Patricia Wald, another great volunteer, here at a seminar on judicial restructuring in Prague, the Czech Republic, in 1992. Together with those leaders, we had a whole generation of ABA presidents who joined the effort, and other ABA leaders as well, traveling to remote locations, standing with our justice sector colleagues, opening doors with donors and other key supporters. It was not always business class. Here you see <laughs> Bob Stein, Homer Moyer, and Mark Ellis on a uh, rather basic air transport into post-war Bosnia. We set the bar high, challenged reformers the world over, and encouraged them wherever we found them. I want to join President Hubbard and uh, Chair Zach in recognizing a particular set of these leaders who have contributed tirelessly to these efforts, the individuals who have chaired the ABA's rule of law programs over the past 25 years. They are all listed in your program. I want to singly, single out the 12 who are here. Please stand I'll, as I read your names, and then we'll applaud you at the end. Homer Moyer, Jim Silkenat. Jose Fernandez, Laura Stein, Lee Middleditch, Margaret McCune, Martha Barnett, Bill Ide, Walter White, Robert Gray, John Yang, and Steve Zack. Thank you, each of you, for your extraordinary leadership. Now, let me linger on that last name just for a minute. And Steve, if I can invite you up here. See, you, you gave me your voice, and now you don't know what's happening. <laughs> this, this meeting uh, marks a transition in the leadership of ABA Rowley. Steve has served us ably as chair of our board for the past four years. And at the end of this meeting, Judge Margaret McCune will take over as the chair of ABA Rowley. Happily, we'll keep Steve involved. Steve, you've seen us through some challenging times as we knitted these different regional projects together. You've been dogged and determined and visionary in that leadership. And you've made us a much better organization. You've built us into an effective global rule of law uh, organization. We are enormously grateful to you for your service. And I'd like to present you with this special uh, tribute for that work. All I can say is I had a fabulous group of people to work with who devoted so much time and effort, their heart and their passion to this. And I thank each and every one of you. Now you've, I've taken you down uh, memory lane, and, and now I'd like to turn your attention to the work that ABA Rowley is doing today throughout the world. Almost 700 volunteers, staff, and consultants working in more than 50 countries. Again, in that same model, partnering with our colleagues and justice sector, um, non-governmental organizations, government ministries, Wherever there are those committed to reform, we are eager to join arms. 
I could go on and on about this terrific work, but as I mentioned, it really is all about the people, and I thought it would be useful to let you hear from the people, some of those 700, about what they're doing around the world. We are the ABA Rule of Law Initiative. For more than 25 years, we've worked in over 100 countries. Last year, we contributed nearly $3 million in pro bono legal assistance. 70 of us work here at ABA headquarters in Washington, D.C. In all, roughly 700 of us work to promote the rule of law around the world. I'm the face of the ABA in Georgia. In this courthouse, four of our trainees won the first jury trial in the country's history. We are the face of ABA Rolling in China. The Rolling trains judges, lawyers, and NGOs to obtain justice for pollution victims. I'm the face of the ABA in the DRC. ABA partners with justice institutions, bar associations, local administrations, communities, and universities for access to justice. I'm the face of ABA Roli in the Russian Federation, and we support the development of public international law research and advocacy skills. I'm the face of ABA in the Philippines. I'm the face of ABA in the Philippines. ABA is bringing ICOR to Davao. Roli has assisted the Philippines to be off the intellectual property watch list for two years in a row. In Mali, the biggest achievement of the ABA Roli is the contribution toward a transitional justice strategy that will pave the way for victims to access justice for gross human rights violations committed during the conflict in 2012. We are the face of ABA in Peru. We support the new criminal procedural reform, working with judges, prosecutors, police, and public defenders. I am the face of the ABA in El Salvador and Guatemala. ABA Rolling supports the strengthening of the forensic science. We are the faces of the ABA Rolling in Kazakhstan. ABA Rolling cooperates with the judicial system of Kazakhstan to implement the judicial program. ABA Rolling also implements a regional program on court monitoring of drug-related criminal cases in Central Asia. We are the face of ABA Egypt. ABA Rolling uh, trains judges, public prosecutors, law professors, law students, and more than 1,500 lawyers since 2009. At the face of ABA Roli in Tajikistan, we establish a public defense center to expand access to justice and provide high-quality public defense services to citizens of Tajikistan. In the Central African Republic, we support the justice sector and ensure constitutional reform in the country. We are the face of ABA Roli Turkey. There are approximately 1.7 million Syrian refugees in Turkey. ABA Roli has a program in partnership with Turkish Bar Associations to protect the legal rights of these refugees. I'm a face of ABA Roli in the Kyrgyz Republic. ABA Roli helped to create a unified national bar joining 1,700 defense attorneys. We are the face of ABA in Armenia. From law students to advocates, cultivating a competent, professional, and conscientious legal, legal community. I am the face of the ABA in the Central Asia. ABA really improves the effectiveness of the criminal justice systems in the region. We are the face of ABA Roli in the Balkans. The mission of the Balkans Regional Rule of Law Network is to contribute to the rule of law and democracy. And the effective protection of human rights by strengthening independent and effective defense bars in cooperation with civil society. I am the face of ABA in Thailand and the Mekong region. ABA Roli builds capacity to tackle corruption and transnational crime. We are the face of the ABA around the world. I love that video. My family gets tired of me making them watch it at home. <laughs> That's our wonderful team around the world, and they are supported also by a terrific 
uh, staff at the ABA, especially here in ABA headquarters. And I want to recognize uh, Jack Rives, the Executive Director of the ABA, and all my colleagues in the Senior Management uh, Team of the ABA who support us in the General Counsel's Office and Human Resources and Finance. You can imagine that ABA Rowley throws some curveballs at them and they catch everyone, and I'm very grateful. One of the most rule of law challenged environments in which we work today is El Salvador, where we are enormously fortunate to have a great representative of the United States and a great, great champion of the rule of law, our distinguished speaker, Ambassador Mari Carmen Aponte. To introduce her and to moderate a conversation about rule of law challenges in Central America and how the ABA and Roley can help. Um, please welcome Chair of ABA Roley's Latin America Council, Judge Margaret McCune of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. <laughs> and Ambassador Fonte. questioning, interrogating, <laughs> have a conversation with our ambassador, and I do promise you that I will be a little friendlier than the Senate Foreign Relations <laughs> Committee. Um, and I, I had the privilege to come to know Mari Carmen uh, through the White House Fellows Program. You've had an amazing career. We know she was born in Puerto Rico, became a lawyer, she helps create the National Hispanic Bar, and then, really, this meteoric rise through government, the private sector, and now our ambassador. So I would like to know, when you were a little girl, and I know your sister is here, she might be able to affirm or deny what you're going to say, but <laughs> did you ever imagine that you would be called Senora Embajadora? And who were your role models along the way? Well, never in a million years. Did I ever think, Margaret, <laughs> that I would be called anything but Mari Carmen Aponte? Still, to this day, I have such reverence for, for the title. But I don't see, I, I sometimes don't respond, I keep walking, um, but it, it is a joy uh, for me. I want to thank, though, I, I have to recognize today so many faces that I grew up with in ABA. Bill Ide, Bill Hubbard, Paulette, Lou Pritchard. My goodness, Lou <laughs> Pritchard. <laughs> um, Martha Barnett, whom I grew up as a young lawyer and who changed my life because they also allowed <clears throat> me to think that there were things that I would never, uh, that I could never imagine that could happen in my life. Um, I also have another confession to make. I am the face of Rolly, and I'll tell you how. The first time I was in El Salvador in 1988 was as a volunteer for CLE. When El Salvador was making its transition to uh, an adversary system in the courts, and I was recruited I guess because I was one of the few young lawyers who spoke Spanish and they needed somebody to translate. It changed my life. Little did I know that I would return to uh, El Salvador in 2010. The lesson is, be a volunteer for Raleigh. You never know where you may end. <laughs> um, my, uh, my models, my parents, um, my mother, who did graduate work uh, when, after I was born, and she came to New York to NYU to do graduate work, encouraged by her father and my father. And my father, who had studied in the States, and 
who made the presumption at the house that both me and my sister would always study in the States. And those, those were the two, probably the most important role models that I had. And of course, everybody who encouraged me um, in the White House Fellows to think of myself in ways that I thought were reserved to Hispanics that spoke to God, and I was not <laughs> one of them. <laughs> so, um, so to um, everybody who, uh, along my journey, um, there's been a lot of encouragement, and that's why I'm here. Great. Well, yesterday was a big day, not only for the American Bar, but for Ambassador Aponte. She received the Margaret Brent Award. I, I like to think of that as sort of the queen for the day. That's, a, of course, a real um, premier spot for the ABA now. It's a luncheon filled with hundreds of thousands of people. And one of the purposes, of course, is to recognize women like you who have paved the way and to give the opportunity for success to others. Tell us about what you've done and how you see your role in that regard. I, I have always felt very strongly and passionately that as a Hispanic in this country, you have got to give back. Um, it's not about you, it's really about the community. And that was my, my guiding light um, as I uh, was younger and kept doing things and kept opening doors because there was nobody um, who was there before me. So you see a door and Sometimes you can't get through, but it's important that you open them so others can get through. Um, I, have, I have been very, very lucky to have great allies throughout my career and my life. I didn't even think that I could be a lawyer. That was another Hispanic who said to me, Nelson Diaz in Philadelphia, who said, as I led, <coughs> I was a teacher then and I was very involved in the student takeovers of the 70s. Um, and Nelson said to me, you know, the way to do this is through the courts. So you've got to go to law school. I never knew again that those things were available to people like me. So I'm grateful because as I went along and I realized that yes, indeed, I could do this. And yes, I had an obligation. Um, my life changed. And fortunately, those of others who saw role models that um, encouraged them to do the kinds of things I was doing and to even go further. Well, a lot of us have some romantic notions about what it must be like to be an ambassador. We've been a little more enlightened lately. We've gotten some WikiLeaks and other <laughs> verified sources. You've been there since 2010. We really want to know, well, what do you do there? What does an ambassador do? If, um, you know, an ambassador is like a lawyer. You never know what your day is going to be like when you go to the office in the morning. It's exactly the same thing. Um, foremost, my job is to protect the interests and to represent the interests of the United States. And, and that means from making sure that U.S. citizens know about uh, places where there uh, it may be no security and no safety in El Salvador. It may also be about investment and where and how and who to talk to about investments. And of course, um, dealing with the government on a daily basis, the Salvadorian government on a daily basis, and um, making sure that they understand what the United States is trying to do uh, in El Salvador. That can be very challenging at times because the present government is a government who were composed of former guerrilla fighters who fought the United States uh, in the 1980s. So persuading them and talking to them is, is, is very interesting. <laughs> um, for the most part though, the reality of the global situation um, today um, makes uh, that work easier 
uh, for the embassy and for me in El Salvador. The truth is that the allies that uh, El Salvador, uh, or at least some, as some portions of the Salvadorian government thought that they would have, um, say Cuba, Venezuela, are no longer viable allies. So reality is dictating that really looking north is a very good place and a very practical place to look to. So we, um, we talk about, uh, about reality and about pragmatism to the Salvadorian government everywhere, and that's how we, uh, we push our agenda. And our agenda really has to do with security, prevention of uh, anti-corruption, um, uh, treatment of women, uh, treatment of children, education. It's a very, very, very broad agenda. Um, but one that we can help with, and um, thanks to the allies that the embassy has, we do. Uh, Contextos, uh, who is one uh, uh, non-government uh, organization that works with the embassy, does a great work in education. Rolly does great work with the embassy. And I tell you why Rolly especially <laughs> is very important. Um, there was a so-called truce in El Salvador in 2012, and the murders allegedly went down. Well, we are now discovering that they did not go down that much, and that there are mass graves where a lot of bodies are now being found. And it is through Rolly and the forensic training that Rolly is providing to the Salvadorian authorities that we are able to find out um, when these murders occur and, and, and who they are and, and the significance, which is um, that the truth in reality did not work, that it was um, a subterfuge um, to deal with the government and really, the result has been uh, now to extort the government, because every time that the government of El Salvador does not agree to give in to the demands of the gangs, they, they just hike the murder rate. And in June, we had 660 people killed. This is in a population of 6 million. This is uh, in, the in the United States, we would have the authorities out there, we would have the National Guard, we would, we would take the bull by the horns. And in El Salvador, they don't have the institutions that we have to deal with those problems as effectively. So, thanks to Raleigh, we now know what really happened when there was an alleged truth. truth. And, and what the reality has been, and what the, El Salvador, the Salvadorian government needs to do to deal with, with the gangs. Let me follow up on the gangs. We have uh, MS-13 and Calle 18 are the two primary gangs. We have them in the United States. We have them in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. So what is the appeal of the gangs, and what is the relationship between the United States government and the El Salvadorian government in trying to stem this tide? Security is our number one priority in the embassy. We have about um, 20 programs, 20 very broad programs that, that address nothing but the issue of security through prevention, through uh, strengthening the institutions uh, like the courts, through doing work with the police and training the police and by this, uh, by last month, we have at least had contact with every policeman in El Salvador in training. Um, the, the security is so overwhelming and it affects every aspect of the operation of the Salvadorian government. Security is the reason, or the lack of it, is the reason why we see the undocumented children taking on an incredible, risky journey through Guatemala, through Mexico, 
to reach our border. Um, the stories, I, I can't even begin to tell you the, the kinds of very tragic stories of what these children go through in trying to get our border. It's very moving, but at the same time, it really motivates us and the Salvadorian government in understanding that we really have to do something um, at the most, uh, uh, at the basis levels. We have to uh, provide the kind of security that, so that people can build their own Salvadorian dreams and they do not have to immigrate and undertake the journey. Um, it is, nothing is more important in our embassy, especially since last June when we saw those murders uh, going up to 660. I should also note that since the beginning of this year, we are seeing a lot of murders of military officers and policemen. We've had 36 um, policemen killed and 24 military officers. I have been to two funerals, one of a military officer and one of a woman policeman. And I cannot tell you how profoundly uh, changing being at those funerals are because these are people who have to live because of the salaries they earn where the gangs operate. And in cemeteries where it is literally a hole in the ground and, and families have no, no compensation for the loss of their relatives where families exp go through grief that is unthinkable. These are 20, 22, 24 year old uh, persons, most of them with families. And to have to witness that is Change, changes anybody's life. It certainly has changed mine. But what I feel is, is really so incredible is how the Salvadorian people go through this 25 times a day because that's how many people are getting killed today. I'm not talking by murder. I'm not talking about natural causes of death. This is 25 times a day of excruciating pain. And that motivates us uh, to do something. Because you can't stand by. You're seeing these people, Salvadorians are laborious. They're hard workers. They're generous. And they are caught in a spiral of violence that they cannot control. And we are trying to do what we can to support them. But it's really, it's really very tough. You know, the children, these are tragic, tragic stories. And they're ending up, of course, many of them in the United States. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. ABA immigration mm -hmm. programs mm -hmm. are working with a lot of the unaccompanied children. Mm -hmm. But as you know, a lot of the parents are sending them, hoping for a better life, yeah. hoping that they won't be there to witness the 25 murders a day. Mm -hmm. On a more granular level, um, how do you convince the parents that that risky journey is got to be put in equipoise somehow with the murder, the security, and the gangs? Well, it's, it's very hard, but we try every day. And we're out, I, I, I'm out there at least three or four times a week talking about this, uh, talking about it publicly yes. and graphically. We also um, help the Salvadorian government take the message out. And they also have done a very effective job. I also have to say that the work we have done with Mexico and Guatemala in trying to make sure that children, especially children, unaccompanied minors are sent back. But listen, this is putting, I understand, it's putting a mother especially between a rock and a very hard place. The options are gangs being killed if you don't join a gang and you're 12 or 13 years old. No possibility of any work or very little work and poverty. Um, it is a very tough position 
That's why we believe in the embassy that the only way to help is to help address the root causes, which is why security is our number one priority in the embassy. Economic development, trying to um, get women uh, to start their own small businesses, the uh, microempresarias, the micro entrepreneurs, because we see that as a way of um, giving hope because otherwise there's very little hope. I, I myself, I'm very partial. I do a lot of um, events with women mm -hmm. because I believe strongly that highlighting them and showing, reflecting the light of the embassy on them and on their work uh, can inspire them and, and can get them to uh, have the means or to generate the means to support a family, even if it's minimally. But it's, it's very, the work that the United States does is very important. It's very visible, um, uh, as we will share with you uh, later on. Uh, they are sometimes um, very funny and some uh, graphic political cartoons <laughs> about the influence of a US ambassador. Uh, <laughs> you'll see. But, <laughs> but it's, um, it, it is an influence that is there. Uh, it's, a, it's part of the history between El Salvador and the United States. And I see my job and a very important aspect of my job as portraying that influence as a constructive and very positive influence. Making sure that even those from the left and even the hard left, which sometimes are very difficult to work with, but got to work with them, got to work with them because I, we got to persuade them that the problems that they have to solve now are the problems of violence and the problems that will change how El Salvador will, uh, will progress uh, and will walk toward the future. It's a challenge every day, but that does not mean we don't take it on with gusto and enthusiasm every single day. <laughs> Well, you can imagine that this ambassador is not what I would call a glass castle ambassador. <laughs> she, <laughs> going and being in El Salvador with her is like being with a rock star. But she's on the street, she's in people's homes, she's in schools, she's in shopping centers, she's in restaurants, and she's there really as a U.S. representative day in and day out. <laughs> You talked about the rule of law, and of course we're the American Bar Association. The question often comes up, so what to the average person, the average American, what does this mean in a broader context, not just that, um, El Salvador, but Central America and others? Why does it matter to have the rule of law outside of our borders? It matters tremendously, because if we don't, especially, especially as to Central America, we are going to end up with the problem right here. Right in Chicago, right in Washington, right in all the Hispanic communities. In a, and we're going to have to deal with it in ways that may not be as humane as we can possibly be. And that's why I think we need to be preventive. We really need to be ahead. We need to solve, we need to help the governments solve their problems so that we don't end up then with the problem. And, I, and look, we have, we have problems. We, I know, I've, I've lived them, I've lived through them. But that does not mean that we can do very constructive and very positive work in other countries. And not only Central America, the proximity of Central America makes it more real. Because I know that a lot of you have been presented with the issue of ha having to hire somebody who may not be documented or who does not have the correct documents. Um, you can imagine what their life is like if sometimes people like you and I don't give a job, but we have to follow the law. We have to, and it's much better 
if we do prevention and we do it in the countries of origin, it will be much better for us, much better for them, and I think much better for everybody. You talked about the security and crackdowns. One of the things I had the opportunity to see is something called a Bartolina, which is a pretrial detention center. So imagine something that's you know maybe even a third of that part of the room over there, and there's uh, one cell no bigger than this stage with scores of people in there. Maybe they're from the MS-13 gang. Next to them is another cell, so to speak, from uh, Calle 18. Over here is everybody else, everybody from like I accidentally popped off on my father-in-law to murderers to juveniles. And in the middle is a, uh, they're outside, they don't have a roof, uh, outside, and then there's a dirt floor with one toilet and no food. So mm -hmm. these are conditions that are as difficult and despicable as, as we've seen in almost any country where Roley works. The question always then is, well, how do you balance security crackdown, police action, with human rights of detainees? It's a difficult balance, um, but it can be done. We are working with the Salvadorian government in a program that combines elements of uh, uh, dealing with uh, gangs uh, based in programs that have worked in Brazil. Uh, programs that have worked in Colombia and programs that have worked here in Chicago and in New York. And we have called it the place-based initiative in which um, you uh, take a, a certain neighborhood or a group of neighborhoods, you uh, send in the police immediately followed by social services uh, in making sure that uh, people will know that they can have access to jobs and access to services. Um, usually, they are now, uh, the, the Salvadorian government is now um, starting to explore this model and, and starting to use it. Uh, they have uh, identified 10 neighborhoods in which they are going to um, implemented. Um, it's, it's tough to implement. We're working very, very closely with them, but we cannot lead it. And sometimes I get the sense that they would love for, for the embassy or the United States to lead, but we cannot lead. It really has, if it's going to work, it has to be a Salvadorian program, and it has to be a Salvadorian initiative. They are the ones that have the authority, not us. We can follow USAID, my goodness, is the, the crown of my embassy. USAID and people to people work and uh, the kind, and, and those, they are the ones developing uh, th these programs, uh, have been leaders, and we do a lot of technical work with the police and the government. Um, we are hopeful that this is uh, in the next month it will be implemented, the first program will be implemented, we're hopeful, we're watching, and you can help us by, if, you, if it's not successful, we'll hear about it. But I'm hopeful that, that it will because we're committed mm -hmm. um, to making sure that El Salvador really uh, needs to go to the next step and to solve its own problems. I know one of the programs that through your embassy they've worked on is a 24-7 court because many of the yeah. people in detention actually are held there longer than their sentence ever might be, mm -hmm. and they've never had a, a court hearing. That's right. They've never had an appearance before a judicial officer. So actually putting, in effect, a mobile court right in to the detention center is one of the innovative things that I know mm -hmm. you're working on. One of the other things I, I really have to mention because it was so impressive, um, the ambassadors talked, of course, of the accords following the Civil War, but not everything ended with the Civil War, and there are certainly factions, as she referenced, with the uh, Grias and some of the prior uh, leaders. I know you have brought together, and we saw it when we came with the White House Fellows, you've brought together these groups, these totally disparate leaders, to sit at a lunch table and talk. Will you talk about that effort and 
whether that was seen as perhaps a little innovative and novel in El Salvador? Um, well, I, um, my father used to tell me that our last name, Aponte, was from the bridge. I guess I took him seriously because when I got to El Salvador and found the incredible polarization between the left and the right, uh, the left was then in government, but not really the, the guerrilla fighters. It was a, a moderate wing of the left party. Uh, and the right was very, very upset because um, they felt that they were being driven to uh, communism and, and we really needed to watch out in the embassy because the carpet was going to be pulled from under us. And the left felt that the oligarchy was at work in trying to uh, take all of El Salvador's resources for themselves and their families and not, as it were, spread the wealth. Um, well, I knew about polarization because I went through hearings <laughs> in the Senate and I know how, how bad it can be. However, however, it gave me the um, motivation to bring people who would never speak to each other um, to come together. And people in the embassy said, ah, you must be insane. They will not come. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. I need to start doing this in my house, at the residence of the ambassador, with no possibility of press, no possibility of anybody listening. I'm bringing them and getting them to know each other as human beings. And that's how we... That's how it all started. Um, uh, by the time the White House fellows came to see me, we went to a restaurant, <laughs> uh, even though the restaurant was closed and we were the only ones there. It was the first time that I had gotten them together outside uh, the ambassador's residence. Because the amb I wanted to make sure that this did not depend on the United States, that they really needed to do this on their own. And once that they knew each other as human beings and stopped demonizing them, each other, because it was, they were talking to each other through the press, calling each other all kinds of names, uh, assuming the absolute worst of any action, not leaving any room for interpretation. And so I used to tell them, I said, look, what I say, I am responsible for. What you interpret, it's on you. If you're not sure, talk to me. Vengan aquí. Get it from me. <laughs> Don't assume. Um, it's, it's very slow. It's worked mm -hmm. with, with certain functions. I still need to do more work. I didn't think I was going to be there as long as I have been there. Um, but that is because I'm waiting now for another confirmation, and it takes a long time. <laughs> So I, every minute that I have in El Salvador, I use to, to make sure that I bring people together and that people get to know each other as human beings. And we all have the same needs. And we all want to be heard. And we all want to make sure that we matter. And we all want to make sure that we make a difference. Um, it must be the women in me. That's why ABA for the next two years, go ABA. <laughs> the nomination she referenced is to the OAS, the Organization of American States. She has been nominated to be your ambassador. Um, now, I know when you got your commission, it said El Salvador. Mm -hmm. So who thought you would be dealing with Cubans? But You've had like one story that was to me right out of a spy novel. Would you share that with us? Um, yes, this, it was one of the most exciting stories, I have to say, of my tenure there. We received a call from Senator Rubio's office that there was a Cuban defector who had been uh, picked up in the Salvadorian uh, border as he was crossing in undocumented from Honduras. And could we do something for him? So immediately 
we brought him uh, to the embassy, and once he was in uh, U.S. grounds, then I called the government. I said, look, I've got this Cuban doctor here, and I want to make sure that we get him to the States. I need your cooperation. All I need is access to the airport. Well, you would have thought I was asking for the moon. <laughs> I was, because the response was, Oh, ambassador, the Cuban embassy is very interested in this doctor. He is their national, and they want him back in Cuba. And I said over my dead body, come get him. <laughs> in the end, after two weeks of negotiations, uh, they finally decided they would deport the Cuban doctor to Honduras. And that was the only even feasible solution they offered. I said, all right. I called the, the US ambassador in Honduras, and I said, have your security meet our security at the border. I, we will get him through Salvadorian immigration. I will hand him over to you. You whisk him off to Honduras, and you send him off to Miami. That's what we did, except that the, the uh, Salvadorian government said to me, you can go ahead and send him with your security. Um, you don't even have to worry about what happens at the border. And I, that was, <laughs> <laughs> I know then I had to do something. So I decided I would take him to the border. I got in the car with him. And when I did that, all my security in the embassy decided they wanted to come with me. We had five cars. I get out the morning at 6 o'clock in the morning on a Friday. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And I, you see these Western movies when they're putting out a fire and the buckets of water are being handed. That's what they were doing with guns. Now, I don't do guns well. I don't do guns at all. At all, they are all kinds of sizes of guns and bazookas and all, and I freaked out. I said, one of this will kill me. Why do we need so many? Well, well, Ambassador, we're going to make sure you get there. Um, the agreement was that I would call the government when the doctor, Cuban doctor was on his way to the border, which I did, and then I said, and I also want to tell you that I, he, I'm with him in the car. Silence. <laughs> um, they didn't say anything. It took five hours from, uh, to get to the border, El Amatillo, with Honduras. And there at an ESSO e -S -S station, they hadn't even changed the name. That's how, <laughs> I mean, this gas station, we met the Salvadorian immigration, and we met our security from Honduras who had also come in an armored car to pick up the Cuban doctor. We put him, and, and I said, no, no, no. I am going to the bridge. When he crosses the bridge, that's when we go home. I'm not leaving him. Well, that's what we did. About six months later, the rumor got to us that the Cubans had followed us the five hours to Amatillo and that they did not do anything because I was in the car. And they did not want to risk an international incident because they were killing or trying to kill an American ambassador. So I um, learned a lot from that Cuban doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I learned, and I also learned, that sometimes when you really believe in something, you can't delegate it. You really got to make sure it gets done. It doesn't matter what you have to go through. I have that, that episode has been a hallmark of my tenure in El Salvador. And one that I have to say earned me the absolute respect <coughs> of every agency I have in that embassy. And I've got 19 agencies, most of which are law enforcement. DEA, ATF, FBI, you name it, I've got it. And they were like, you know, this one is from the Hispanic community, you know, those liberals here. <laughs> when I did that, 
they were all waiting for me when I got back. And it has been, I earned their respect, and they have made it very easy for us to work together. After that incident, that incident was about five or six months after I, I got there. <laughs> Amazing story. I, I think you'll have lifetime medical care. You don't have to worry about that from the doctor. And she gives the personal service of an ambassador a new name. Now, when she went to El Salvador, it was on a recess appointment. Then she had to pack up her clothes, her art, her family pictures, haul it back to the United States, and then wait for a confirmation. And so she did that, and then she could move all of her art and her clothes and her family pictures back to the embassy. So she's been there now five years. You've had some great press. I know you've had some very hilarious press in terms of political cartoons. So to close this, I'd like to show the audience some of those political cartoons and ask you to tell us what, what has been some of the most professionally rewarding experiences you've had. Don't you love that Wonder Woman? <laughs> <laughs> this is from um, a, a Colatino, which is a leftist-leaning uh, paper. And the issue there that I was defending two American citizens who were in the Salvadorian courts for allegedly exercising undue influence on, uh, on an energy company that belonged to the state. And they had been uh, executive of the company in a previous administration. We understood that this was a, a political issue. We had been through the evidence. I was sure of what I was doing in terms of where we stood. Um, and the left were very upset with me because I, in the, publicly what I had said was that we were observing the process uh, very closely. Uh, I did not say whether I thought they were innocent or, or, or what I thought about the evidence, uh, but that they interpreted my, uh, and my comments on uh, the rule of law, and I was sure and I had confidence in the Salvadorian uh, court system, uh, they interpreted that, that I was trying to influence uh, the judges, and that's how they viewed it. Um, eventually, uh, they were found not guilty, and uh, those are two very glad, they are very unhappy American citizens, and I'm very proud of that work we did with them. There's an, oh. Do we have another one? <laughs> Don't you love that? <laughs> the influence of the US from Uncle Sam to me through telepathy, <laughs> <laughs> through the press, because they feel that I influence the press too much. And what I'm talking at the CC is corruption. It's, uh, I, we have been advocating in the embassy, and I've been very public about the stand of the embassy on anti-corruption. Um, we have been calling for the uh, UN type of commission against impunity. And the left does not want it. And I can't even understand why, because they, kept to, they came to the election saying they wanted to end corruption, but I guess not my type of corruption. <laughs> um, and this is um, their version. I thought it was interesting that the press, that I, that, that I was, uh, in the statements that I made uh, trying to influence the press. And this one is my favorite one. This is uh, uh, about a year ago after the new government was elected. And if you see the, uh, uh, the words on the far right, uh, it's with my accent. One moment, please. <laughs> but it's, it's written in Spanish, one moment, please. <laughs> and I'm, what I'm saying is, we have not heard from the Supreme Court yet. The elections are not over. Basically, that's what I'm saying. And I have, they dress me with a flag. I love it. <laughs> I have never had, I, I won an outfit like that before yeah. I leave El Salvador. <laughs> and these are the, <laughs> the president, I, I, uh, the vice president saying, Yes, 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 we've won the election. Well, they hadn't because it was being challenged in the Supreme Court. 
and they were in a hurry to take over. And I was saying, yo, <laughs> we have to wait for the Supreme Court. <coughs> uh, in the end, the Supreme Court validated the election. Um, and I still don't have my flag dress, but I promise you, I'm going to come to a rolling meeting at ABA with my flag dress. <laughs> I, I'm, thank you. Thank you for, for listening to me. Um, being U.S. Ambassador is something I never dreamed that I could be. Uh, I am very grateful to, to this administration and to the United States for having given me the opportunity of being the first Puerto Rican woman to be a United States Ambassador. So there's others who can do it as well. Well, I wish we had been prescient enough to present you with the outfit, but <laughs> we weren't, so I can only say that um, as my friend, as our fellow ABA member, and as our ambassador, please join me in thanking Ambassador Ponte. <laughs> <laughs>